I just wanted to play Kid Icarus Uprising again. Remember Kid Icarus? Nintendo, I'm talking to you. Do you remember Kid Icarus? All right, listen, I get it. Zelda, Pokemon, Mario, it is foolish to expect friggin' Star Tropics to be talked about in the same breath, but there's always gonna be a few of those franchises where you sit back and think to yourself, ah, uh, what if? As we celebrate the 35th anniversary of Metroid, I figured now is as good a time as any to talk about another NES classic that released that same year. That's right, I'm talking about Urban Champion. Listen, a sequel would be pretty cool. If you really think about it, it could be some really good stuff. But instead, today, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna talk about Kid Icarus instead. It released in 86 in Japan, 87 everywhere else. But hey, close enough. Like I said, I kind of just wanted to play Uprising again. What a strange series Kid Icarus is. Only three games over its entire history with a massive 20 year gap in between two of them and a good portion of you out there just said, wait, there's a Game Boy game? There really isn't much to this franchise. The original is, okay. It's a platformer that starts off with a totally vertical level and slightly slippery controls where one fall brings you right to the beginning. I'll be honest, took me years to realize there was actually a level two. Sometimes rooms have vases in them. Sometimes they have noses. Sometimes you enter a shop filled with items that you can't afford. The most enjoyment I get from the first Kid Icarus is just watching the Grim Reaper dudes lose their minds at the sight of you. The Game Boy sequel, Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters is kind of better, but I don't know, man. I just don't think these are for me. It controls better, and there is a novelty to having a game like this on the Game Boy, but I don't know. Cool aesthetic, but not something I could really get into. And why in both games do they stock items that are too expensive for you? I don't understand. Wait, crouching changes the I Crouching changes the items? After those two titles came and went, we didn't really get a whole lot of anything. We got Pit to show up as a trophy in Melee. That's, that's it. Regarding today's game, Uprising, well, not much has really happened since its release outside of merely existing in Smash Bros, but it doesn't feel like that long ago when said existence in Smash Bros is what kicked off a massive resurgence of interest. After being upgraded from trophy to fighter in Brawl, people started talking, leading to Nintendo using this relatively niche series as a title to showcase the power of their new handheld, the 3DS. By the way, with a trailer that is still, by all accounts, incredible. The voice acting for Pit is different and not as good, so that's a bit jarring, but still, really, really good stuff. And besides, the trailer starts off with, sorry to keep you waiting. That was genius. Sorry to keep you waiting. This really was a massive jump from the last time he showed up in a game where all he did was yell hi ya 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 a lot. Super Mario 3D Land, Ocarina of Time, Star Fox 64 3D, all great games that do take advantage of the console's power, but the scope of Kid Icarus Uprising, it just seemed too good to be true. They were clearly putting a lot of faith into this angel, and at the end of the day, it sold well, reviewed really well, and it only hurts a little bit to actually play, so... Why does it still feel like this game is so underappreciated? It's a stupid question, actually. It's because Nintendo never acknowledges it. The hype behind this game was wild, man. It wasn't just because the debut trailer was cool. It wasn't just because it got a spotlight that one time Nintendo did really awesome things with unnaturally shaped screens. It was because all of this was helmed by my favorite Kirby creator and yours, Masahiro Sakurai. I gotta tell you, before Pit showed up in Super Smash Bros. Brawl, I really didn't even know Kid Icarus existed. I didn't really care that much about the trophies in Melee to go, oh, that's a thing I should look into. It was just... A guy. This all took place right before the big retro game boom of the late 2000s, and sure, more people did get to experience Kid Icarus on the virtual console during that time, but Sakurai kinda decided to revive Pit just because he could. And that simple inclusion in Smash generated a lot of interest and a lot of conversation in the idea of a brand new game. But years came and went, and we got nothing. Sakurai even started an entirely new company after Brawl's release, Project Sora. That's pretty strange, I wonder what they're working on. Come to find out, that team was created for the sole purpose of making that new Kid Icarus game. And once that was all said and done and the game was in people's hands, Project Sora closed its doors, and Sakurai went back to working on Smash. Absolute legend. 
Oh, and Nintendo was definitely not messing around when it came to building up excitement for the game either. Releasing alongside Uprising and also acting as a bonus for pre-orders, we got a pseudo-remake of the NES game under the 3D Classics brand. You remember these? Yeah, at this time, Nintendo figured a way to show off the 3DS's 3D was to polish up some NES games. And it was pretty neat while it lasted. In this case, it is just the same game with some new graphics and maybe kinda better controls. I'm not sure I was actually able to beat this one. But oh man, you take one look at what they did to Urban Champion. Oh, one second the camera does this, and then the camera does this. <laughs> Whoa. The 3D Classics line is also responsible for giving us arguably the definitive way to play Kirby's Adventure, so maybe I'm just biased in this regard. There were also three animated shorts, each coming from a different studio, showcasing very different art styles and totally different stories. This was really awesome too, they gave these cute little looks into the universe that they were trying to build back up and they still hold up today, they are really entertaining. They did the same thing with Pikmin years later with the Pikmin short movies, and they were great as well. Man, it really goes to show you that under the right people, Nintendo series adapts to cartoons really well. Well, excuse... Under the right people. At the time, in the late 2000s, Nintendo was really keen on reviving old franchises. Wario Land, Punch-Out, Pilot Wings, Excite Bike with three games. But undoubtedly, while it was kind of expected at this point, Kid Icarus was made the biggest deal of them all. And that's awesome. It even got a big box release. Oh, you gotta love those. A soundtrack is included, I bet. The music has to be pretty good. The hell is this? A stand came included with the game? That's... Really weird, why would I need that? Oh. Going into this adventure, it was kinda hard to know what to expect. Nintendo had no shortage of trailers to let people know what Uprising was all about, but I'll be honest, they had me sold on it just being a Kid Icarus game in the year 2011. I was ready for anything. But when you do dive in, you discover you can mess around with all the buttons on the main menu. That is an easy way to get me totally invested. The console's battery level is also visible at all times too, I forgot about that part. Yeah, at all times in the game, that little box right there is gonna let you know how good your battery is no matter what you can't turn it off to my knowledge no other 3ds game does that i mean Star Fox 64 3d actually does do it as well but at least there it doesn't show up on the actual gameplay it's just on the bottom screen why is this like the only game that does this and also the console itself does a pretty good job letting you know so why waste the screen space but okay we're finally playing here one tutorial segment later we are in and oh oh it feels good to be back so, Kid Icarus Uprising has two distinct gameplay styles. Air battles, which are basically fast-paced, enemy-filled roller coasters where you dart around the screen to avoid obstacles and aim your reticle with the touchscreen to shoot at enemies. And then there's land battles, which slow things down, give you more full control, and plays more like a third-person shooter hack-and-slash hybrid. I often see people compare the air combat style to Star Fox, which is kind of fair, but it also shows how few people out there have played Sin and Punishment, because... It's, it's the exact same thing, just more colorful. There's this mechanic in Kid Icarus where if you tap the fire button, you will swing the weapon before firing it, allowing you to hit enemies when they're up close to you. Sin and Punishment has the exact same thing. Basically, I'm just saying you should all play Star Successor. That's all I ask, that game's amazing as well. Both of these gameplay styles feel really satisfying when you get a good grasp of things, but that's where the main talking point with Uprising finally comes in. Playing this game, at times, can be legitimately physically painful. Holding the 3DS up with one hand, constantly maneuvering the circle pad and pressing the fire button at the same time while the other hand feverishly scrubs the touchscreen. Yeah, that part kinda sucks. And that's strictly with the lighter original 3DS model. When the XL comes into the picture with it being slightly heavier, any control issues just get amplified. And that is why the game came included with a stand. You prop the 3DS on it while you play and theoretically it is meant to alleviate some of the pressure. Personally though, I don't think this is comfortable at all. Technically, you don't need to play with the touchscreen, you can use the face buttons to move the reticle around as well, but with how frantic the action can be, that lack of precision is far from ideal. It's like when they added touchscreen support to Mario 64 on the DS. Not good. 
And even when the 3DS finally got a second analog nub, you remember the Circle Pad Pro? Probably not. Here it is. The game never got updated to support it. And again, dual analog may not have been the most ideal, but it would have been a really good second option. It's just a shame that the controls are holding the game back as much as they do, especially in the advent of current age where gyro controls are all the rage and they are awesome. Can you imagine Kid Icarus Uprising with gyro aiming? It would be so good. Would probably need some fine tuning, but hey, I'm up optimistic. Point being, if you can figure out how to position the system and you feel like you're in full control, damn, Kid Icarus Uprising feels really good. Bobbing and weaving around an army of enemies and watching them all explode with a bunch of hearts flying all over the place, it never gets old. And this is partially due to how much freedom you have when you go into these chapters. So many weapons, dude, like holy cow, you have so many weapon options, from floating orbs to bow and arrows. You got claws that typically do great for melee combat. There are these big chunky cannons, oh, and so much more. And each one also has its own set of unique attributes. You may have two of the same name, but they may provide entirely different benefits. And then we have weapon fusion, which, I, I don't know, maybe there's a science to this, but I kind of just press a bunch of buttons on two weapons that look like the outcome is going to give me a higher number than the two weapons going into it, and then, hey, I'm done. I'm going to use this now. It's like I'm fusing personas. I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing, but I'm having a damn fun time doing it. Usually when a game has a bunch of different weapons, I'm always curious about what the ultimate one could be, but that's the thing with this game. There is no definitive best weapon, and that is probably for the best. You just play how you want to play and have fun. It's as simple as that. Clearly, Sakurai wanted to prioritize you having fun and not having the pressure of trying to go for an ultimate goal, and hey, that's alright by me. On top of all that, you also have full control over how difficult you want the game to be. Yes, the difficulty slider that we would eventually see in Smash Bros, it debuted here. I have mentioned before that I don't really think that bar makes a ton of sense in Smash because it's really hard to quantify the difference between 7.2 and 7.3 aside from the final point score, but here there is a lot more at stake. The amount of enemies change, how fast they attack changes, how much damage you take changes, how many hearts you gain at the end of the chapter changes, which by the way that can factor into buying more weapons, which is important, and there's also these optional challenge gates that will only open up if you're at that specific level or higher at that point in the chapter. Being able to visualize all those differences really shows the weight of your choice in the difficulty that you choose. So yeah, Kid Icarus did it better than Smash. And on top of that, once again, there is also a full set of three challenge boards. Completing specific chapters with specific weapons or specific difficulties, maybe under a specific time limit, there are so many any challenges that you can go for if you want to play the game over and over and over again. Going from start to finish is only part of the adventure here. The amount of replayability just throughout this 25 chapter campaign is absurd. But is that all really worth it if the health of your wrist is on the line? Yeah, yeah I would say so. It is very easy to compare all of these features to the variety of content you can find in Smash Bros, but I would more so relate this to Kirby's Air Ride instead. Another result of Masahiro Sakurai just letting his creativity flow and overloading the players with options, replayability, and most of all, fun. Also, kinda just wanted another reason to bring up Kirby's Air Ride, that game is still amazing. But when you really boil this game down to its most basic values, the gameplay could potentially run stale if it wasn't for the story, which, in my opinion, this may sound like hyperbole, is easily one of the best methods of storytelling in any Nintendo game ever. Doing something that you really don't see too often, practically all of the story beats take place during gameplay, managing to keep you invested in what you're doing without stopping you from actually playing the game. There are a few more traditional cutscenes here or there that are really well done and very nicely animated, mostly at the end of chapters, but nearly all of the dialogue and character interactions, they take place while you're dodging and shooting, letting you know why you are where you are and constantly blending comedic, serious, and fourth wall breaking tones all the time, and it never manages to interfere with the action. That is really impressive. Dude, there's this one moment where they start joking about Brain Age, like out of nowhere, and I had forgotten that Brain Age was a thing at this point, so this whole interaction is amazing. Oh, uh, and speaking of the interactions, the cast of characters, man, is so, so good. Of course, you got Pit, who's a fantastic protagonist. You got his counterpart, Dark Pit, who goes way beyond just being a little basic edgelord version of Pit and actually justifies his existence in Smash way more than people give him credit for. You got Palutena, the goddess of light, who seems like she may be 
all threatening and imposing, but she's actually just a massive dork, and that's great. You got newcomer Viridi, who is a perfect chaotic neutral goddess of nature who really shines in the later half of the game where she gets a ton of screen time. You got the big bad guy, Hades. Oh man, the amount of snark coming from this man is relentless. Every time him and Pitt interact, it's amazing. Viridi is one of the characters that shows up more than anybody actually, which is pretty wild considering one of her first actions is throwing and detonating a massive bomb in an attempt to extinguish all human life. Why yes, this would make a good stage in Smash. Oh, and this barely even scratches the surface of all the characters we have here. There are so many one-offs as well. New characters are thrown at you like every 20 minutes, and then when you move on to a new chapter, a new character comes in to talk to, and it keeps happening, and all of them are great. Nobody overstays their welcome either. They contribute just enough to the story, and then they move on. I will say though, the alien threat, the Aurum, they really didn't do anything for me. About halfway through the game, they kind of show up out of nowhere, and then after only three chapters, you take them all out, and they barely ever get mentioned again. Some of the enemy variants do pop up here or there, but that's about it. They mainly seem to serve as a decent jumping off point to the following arc, which was awesome, but as they stand, the Aurum themselves are kind of just whatever in my opinion. Pyron shows up during this arc, and he's kind of cool. But I got a feeling a lot of you forgot about this guy, and I think that speaks volumes. Everything about Kid Icarus Uprising shows what happens when Sakurai has full creative control of whatever it is he wants to do. The gameplay, options, the story, he knows exactly what the people want before anybody even knows that's what they want. Kid Icarus Uprising is a masterclass in how to execute a franchise reboot in fantastic fashion. Masahiro Sakurai managed to take a game from the world of relative obscurity and go absolutely wild with it. Even more impressive when you remember the original games are not that good. Gameplay mechanics, variety, character direction, storytelling, no matter how much time passes or will pass, this game will always be fantastic. I probably can't use my wrists to full capacity for a little bit, but hey. It was all worth it. In a time where Nintendo was rebooting dormant franchises left, right, and center, Kid Icarus easily got the best treatment of them all. And that is still absolutely crazy to say out loud. And yeah, of course, that's not even mentioning the multiplayer, which in early 2021 is still surprisingly active. That's awesome. The team-based mode, Light vs. Dark, is so cool. It's a really neat take on a typical 3v3 team deathmatch. Basically, each squad of three has a shared life bar, and when that life bar gets depleted, the player's death that caused that life bar to be depleted turns into either Pit or Dark Pit for their respective team. And only when they're defeated is when the opposing team wins. There is the option to do a more normal deathmatch mode here, but man, Light vs. Dark is so, so cool. And I don't necessarily mean to brag here, but according to the few games that I did play, it looks like I'm the best by a fairly large margin. Look at the numbers, I'm not lying to you. I'm just stating facts. Oh yeah, and then there's also the AR mode. Oh man, I forgot about this one. See, alongside the game, they also released a bunch of cards, and you can make the characters on them do battle using the special camera functionality of the 3DS. I mean, it's not... It's not good, but it's interesting. Thinking back to a time where Nintendo was doing some really weird things before settling on hard plastic. Yeah, that part, that part's pretty fun. So, after finally replaying this game, I'm gonna start echoing what all of you have been saying for years. It is time for a Kid Icarus Uprising port or sequel on an HD console. For the love of all that is holy, they're doing Miitopia. Why won't they do Kid Icarus? Now Masahiro Sakurai has stated, it's on record, that he doesn't believe either of those two things will happen, but hey, I'm a gamer on the internet, so I'm not gonna listen, I'm gonna beg for it anyway. For now, my thought is that perhaps we'll see someone else besides me make another Kid Icarus in another 25 years. Alright, well you heard it here first, be sure to like this video and subscribe, because when the year 2046 comes around, I'll be here to talk about Kid Icarus Uprising 2. Hopefully.